All right, if you take your Bible this morning and turn over to the book of Matthew, find your place in Matthew chapter 7. It's finding your place in Matthew 7. I noticed Mark Glenn walked in. He had a little surgery this past week, and I'm glad that he's able to be on his feet back with us. And we want to mention as well uh, Mrs. Woodruff. Ken Woodruff is here, but his wife had a little fall and uh, hurt herself a little and is recovering. Some of many of you know that, but I want to keep her in prayer. And her husband's trying his best to keep her off her feet. Had to give her some drugs, I think, to knock her down and <laughs> keep her from being so. Because if you know Miss Woodruff, she's kind of hard to keep down, but she needs to heal a little bit. So keep her in prayer if you would. I found out from uh, Brother Bill Ashley, you can't talk about people behind their back anymore. Miss Woodruff probably listened to me this morning on live stream. I tried to criticize him Wednesday night, and he's watching the live stream. So I'll have to be more careful. I'll just wait till you hear to criticize you anyway. So, All right. As you find your place in Matthew chapter 7, this is a very familiar passage, and a passage we sing songs about, and a passage I have preached from this passage numerous times in different ways, but it's quite a principle that I think it'd be great to carry with us this morning. And before we read that passage in Matthew chapter 7, let's take a moment and have a word of prayer. Lord, we pray this morning as we open up the word of God that, Lord, you would allow the simplicity of your word to sink down into our heart, that you would look into the heart of each person and whatever the need might be. There could be folks this morning who are going through difficulty that need to be encouraged and helped. There could be others who are cold and indifferent in their heart that need to be stirred. There could be folks this morning that do not personally know the Lord Jesus Christ and need to know how to be saved. But Lord, I know only you could accomplish what needs to be done. So we pray you'd exalt yourself this morning that Jesus would be lifted up. And we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 7, I'll begin in verse 24. And you'll notice it says, Therefore which of course refers us to the previous verses. He says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Do you know Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is one of the most well-known sermons that Jesus ever preached? It's the longest recorded sermon in the Gospels, and often the sayings from this sermon is quoted by people who really are not even that familiar with the Bible. It is in this sermon that we find blessed are the meek. It is in this sermon that we find Jesus telling us to turn the other cheek. It is in this sermon where Jesus gives us the principles of the kingdom, which may be the reason why even the world picks up on some of this idea of peace on earth and what it will be like when Jesus reigns. Now, the principle that this kingdom will not see implemented fully until Jesus is in charge, sitting on the throne, but it is some wonderful principles that God teaches. But even though people often like to quote the Sermon on the Mount, seldom do they come to the end of this sermon and remind us of the conclusion that Jesus drew. You see, when we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, first of all, talks about two ways. He says that there's a broad way and a narrow way. It reminds us that the Bible says there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Certainly the world, the easy way, the broad way is natural to take, but the narrow way is the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, the way of the cross, and few there be that find it. He also talks about two trees. He says that there's two trees that produce two different kinds of fruit because the essential nature of those trees, one is evil and one is good. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit and vice versa. An evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. He warns us that there are false teachers who say much, but inside they're evil, and their fruits will prove who they are. He also talks about two outcomes. He talks about many that will say unto him in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not uh, prophesied in thy name? And he professes unto them, I never knew you. And then he concludes his sermon with this little parable of the rich man, or rather the wise man and the foolish man. And he says, therefore, that is, Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them. 
I've given you all these principles. I've described this uh, way that there is unto the man. And he says, if you hear it, that's wonderful. But how much more if you hear it and do it? You know, this world has a lot of information to give. There's a lot of new discoveries, a lot of things that we're exposed to. We're impressed with the ability. They're able to take a microscope and find smaller things than we've ever seen and realize that there's almost no limit to what we can find if we can magnify it enough to see it. We've also gone out into space with a Hubble telescope and found galaxies and stars and things that we uh, perhaps speculated about before and now we actually see. Now man's conclusion to that is he's becoming greater. Our conclusion as we find these things is that God was already great and now we're just being exposed to it. But man with all of his technology and all that he's able to find out, as much as we might be impressed with the things that he's explored and the things that he's found, Have you ever thought about the fact that man has not answered life's most basic problems? Do you know as our community as a whole really has no answer for where did we come from? You say, well, preacher, I know the answer to that. Well, if you know the Bible, and it is a simple answer. But if you reject the Bible and refuse to say that this is the authoritative word of God, you really do not know where you came from. It's pure speculation. They do not know where we're going. You say, well, preacher, that's easy. We know how it all ends. We know eventually Jesus comes, sits up a throne. We know if we die, we're in heaven. We know folks without uh, Christ go to hell. We kind of know what the future holds, but that's because you have the authority of the Bible. If you didn't have the Bible, if there were no Bible, man has no answer where he came from, where he's going, but most importantly, man has no answer for why he is here. Do you realize that man, apart from the Bible, it doesn't matter what his culture is, where in the world he lives, at what point in history it was, it can be in this technological age. You can go back to the father's times when there were heathen idolatry, and their purpose for being on here was unknown. If you're an evolutionist or a secularist, you believe that you're just here by chance. That somehow it just happened here, perhaps it happened in other places the same way, and there's absolutely no purpose in your life. But if you believe this book... And understand that this book has played itself out and demonstrated to be the authoritative word of God. You most definitely have a purpose for being on this earth. And our purpose is to glorify God and to know him. Do you understand that today, if I am to have those questions answered, I must have some authority to answer them. There must be someone bigger than me to give me the answer to those questions. And yet those answers are available. Do you know we live really in an unstable world? I mean, we live in a world where people don't have only the answers they're not even sure what questions to ask but if you want some stability today if you'd like to be able to say i want some direction in my life and i'd like to know that i have a stable place to put down at least some aspect of authority so i'll know where i'm going let me tell you that the bible is that foundation and jesus says these sayings of mine will give a life stability he says a wise man will build his life on something that's stable And he says, a foolish man will build his life on something unstable. Let me ask you today, where is your life built? That is the whole projection of your future. The whole thought of what drives you. The whole idea of what it is that makes you who you are and you do the things that you do. Is it built upon a foundation as stable as the word of God or is it something else? Let me just show you today some things that Jesus says that show us if we want to build our life on a proper foundation, how can we do it? Well, it's real simple. I think, first of all, this goes without saying, we've got to recognize the foundation. In other words, what is this foundation? Yes, I believe we ought to have a foundation. I mean, surely there's got to be something solid. Um, I'm not going to take time to expose all the false foundations. That wouldn't be necessary, nor could we finish. There's plenty of false foundations you could build your life on. If you want to build your foundation on the life of money, you'll find that money is spurious, that it goes away quickly. If you want to build your life on the foundation of so-called science, you'll find that science changes all the time. Do you know if you were to go get a textbook, I'll just go way back and say when I was in school, back when I was in the sixth grade in the earlier part of this century, back when 01, something like that, uh, back when I was in the sixth grade, if I were to take a science book, Do you know if I were to take that science book today and bring it up and compare it to a sixth grade science book of today that most of the stuff would be relegated to just uh, antiquated and become obsolete and no good? 
Now, a few things, how far the sun, that remains sane. How far away is the moon? That's about much the same. Who invented the microscope? That's, all of that stuff stays the same, but their conclusions, the conclusions that they draw are considered now to be obsolete because it's constantly changing. You say, well, you'd expect that. They're constantly learning. No, they don't just add to it. They don't go back and say, now, the conclusion we drew in 1975 was correct, but we found out that this much more. No, they, what they say is, the conclusion we drew in 1975, we realized, couldn't be true because of this. So here's the new conclusion. But they don't put it down as just an opinion. They say, this is concrete authority. Let me tell you something. That's a shaky foundation. A foundation that changes that much is shaky. But let me tell you that this book, if you recognize the sayings of Jesus, and by the way, the sayings of Jesus are not just the ones in red in your Bible. The sayings of Jesus begin in Genesis 1-1 and end with Revelation 22-19. It is everything in between. It is the Word of God. Now, this foundation is a sure foundation. It's certainly the stable foundation. But I think it's first of all helpful to remember Jesus said these sayings of mine. Who is the person behind these sayings. Well, that's what makes it authoritative. You see, God Almighty is the inspire behind this book. That is, God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's the one that gave us the sayings. And by the way, He Himself is a foundation. Do you know 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, No other, or other foundation can no man lay, but then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In Matthew 16, 18, He said, Upon this rock... I will build my church. You see, Jesus himself is a foundation, and the only way you can know him is through the book where he has revealed himself. So the person of the book shows us that these sayings are based on an authoritative person, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, not only do I understand the purpose or the person of this book, but there's a purpose behind it. I've got to recognize that God had a reason for giving me his word. You know, first and foremost, I believe he gave us this word to reveal himself. God wants me to know him. You know, John 17, 3, Jesus prayed to the Father that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He wants me to know who he is. Do you know this book tells me how I can have eternal life? Do you realize today you could in your mind have some unclear thought as to whether or not that you'd go to heaven when you die? You know, perhaps somebody's young, they give very little thought to eternity, they just don't really think about the conclusion, but the fact is, nobody has ever got out of this world alive except Enoch and Elijah, and that was for a purpose that God had, but we just don't leave this world without going through the gate of death. I'd better find out where I'm going when I leave here. Do you realize you can speculate all you like, but there's only one authoritative source that tells me what happens beyond the grave, and that's the Word of God. And it tells me that the person who can give me eternal life is none other than the Lord Jesus. You see, the Bible tells me in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name, and this book reveals that name. So very simply this morning, God certainly has given us this book that we might know how to have eternal life. Hey, how would you know today that you had offended a holy God? if God hadn't told you that all had sinned and come short of the glory of God? How would you know there's an eternal judgment for sin if God didn't say, he that believeth not is condemned already? How would you know that there is a place called heaven if God didn't describe it for us and say, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Hey, God gives us this book to reveal himself. But you know, I think there's another purpose as well. It also provides for us direction. You know, how are you going to have direction in your life if you don't have some kind of compass, some kind of direction? When I was in Nova Scotia, Canada, back in, um, this would have been 1990, I guess it was, and we were there, I was on a, like a mission trip with my youth group at church. I had gone to college uh, a year or two, and they asked me to go with them, and so we were up there, and we were holding a vacation Bible school. So in order to do that, we were helping the missionary, just a small little church they had in Liscombe, Nova Scotia. There is a, a, a road, I think it's Highway 7, that goes down the coast of Nova Scotia, and there's little towns all along that road. And so we left Liscombe, and we would go down. He had a, had a church van, and it looked just like one a missionary would own. And we had this church van, and we headed off down the road, and it was, um, had no seats in the back. Now, believe it or not, I picked up 36 kids in that little van. It wasn't an extended van. 
It was a regular van with no seats in it. And I put 36 kids in it. So we went down the highway picking up kids. And the thing I remember is I didn't know how to get to everywhere. The highway got you to most places, but there was a couple of kids and the missionary knew. And he said, now I want you to go down to this particular uh, town and, and, and find this little kid that lives back here. And so I asked one of the locals, I think I maybe stopped at a place and said, can you tell me how to find uh, the Joneses or whoever it might have been? And everybody knew everybody. They said, well, sure, that's easy. He says, I want you to go down and take a certain road. And he said, now you have to be careful because where you're going to turn left, he says, there's no marker there. He said, but if you'll notice, there's a post. It's like a telephone pole sitting on the right. And there's a large bird sitting on top of the telephone pole. So that's your key. And so I'm riding down, looking for this large, of course, you know, ceramic, uh, like garden furniture type bird sitting on top of the thing. Made sense to me. So I'm riding down. Sure enough, there's the big old large bird sitting on top of the pole. And I turned and I found the kid. Now, I brought, picked up the kid, heading back out. And I looked up at that bird. It was a real bird. It was alive. I talked to somebody about it at the church. I said, man, you know what kind of directions this guy gave me? He told me to turn where the bird sits on top of the pole. And I said, sure enough, the bird was there. He said, that bird sits there all the time. He said, everybody knows the pole where the bird sits. I mean, that's just where it's at. I mean, because he's there all the time. But I'm going to tell you this. About Thursday of that week, I came down the road, and the bird was out getting food or something. It was gone. Now, he was there most of the time. He was there a lot of time. But the bird couldn't stay there all the time. It had to go eat. It had to leave sometime. Now, that was probably good directions in the sense that that bird was likely to be there. But you know, when it comes to directions about my life, I want something a little more stable than something that moves like that. I want something a little more stable than something that happens to work often. Something that maybe has helped a little bit in the past. I want something that's right 100% of the time, and that's what I got in this book. It'll give you direction in your life. Does the Bible not say in Psalm 119... That the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I mean, it does both. It'll light up the path and it'll give me the very next step I'm supposed to take. It is a solid foundation to give me direction in my life. Well, let me tell you, it goes a little deeper than your personal life. Do you know this book gives us a moral compass? That is, it tells us what right and wrong is. I mean, how are you really going to know what right and wrong is unless the Bible tells you. You know, Paul said over in Romans chapter 7, he said, I had not known lust, except the Bible said, thou shalt not covet. You know, it's interesting how our world views right and wrong. What they are adamantly opposed to, what they look at as the biggest ethical and moral failure that a person can have, often is something completely different than what the Bible says, because they have no compass. I read a story, or an article, I believe it was, about a so-called preacher. He was from a large denomination, and he had started a series of sermons. And he advertised his series of sermons on the billboards in the town to get people interested so they would come. And the essence of the billboard campaign and the essence of his sermon was simply this. He said, homosexuality is a gift from God, and sin is not recognizing and being satisfied with the way God made you. Now, you understand that might have grabbed the attention and that might have got a people interested to say, man, I want to hear this preacher get in and brag on homosexuality and tell us that we're in sin. If we don't just get be glad that God made us that way, boy, that might be interesting. Look, that might have drawn some people in to find out what he was going to say. But that man has no moral compass. Right. Hey, who am I to determine that it's OK to be involved in sexual immorality? It's God who said, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. It was God who said, be not deceived, neither abusers of themselves with mankind nor effeminate shall inherit the kingdom of God. It was God who said that's an abomination to him. It wasn't my decision. The world has no moral compass, so they look and say, well, to me, I just feel like, to me, I just think that it would be good. I mean, I just can't understand why you wouldn't. None of that matters. All that matters is thus saith the Lord. And to prove that it is not concrete is it changes constantly. Hey, our own president stood before the election and said, well, I myself, you know, I'm not really opposed to homosexuality. I'm not, and I, but I don't believe we ought to give it the credence of marriage. 
it wasn't two or three years because it was politically expedient. He believes we ought to give it the credence of marriage. Now understand, I'm not picking out just one sin. All sin is an offense to God. But when our society refuses to recognize a moral compass, you know who it's going to be detrimental to? To the people that they won't call what they're doing is not sin. Because we're not offering any help. Hey, we're saying this is not a problem. It's perfectly acceptable. You ought to be okay with it. Hey, we're not at a point uh, where the world just says, let's let it go by. Their moral compass says that those that are opposed to it, to believe those folks are in sin, they need help with the power of the gospel, that it needs to be viewed just like any other sin. It needs to be viewed as an offense to God, that those people, they're the ones that are wrong. Well, not according to thus saith the Lord. And you know what? I'd rather stand with him than stand with the society. Now, without the word of God, Without this foundation, every new decade would bring new morals. But when we go back to this book, we find that it's been around for some 3,000 years, and it hasn't changed. It still says what it always says. So this, this book, is if we recognize what it is, we recognize the person of the book is the Lord Jesus. We recognize the purpose behind it. And then we have to recognize the power. Hey, this book has power. Amen. Hebrews 4.12 The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. What makes it so powerful? Well, just notice in in the passage we read in verse 28. It says, It came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now, it it isn't hard to understand. People were impressed with his miracles, right? I mean, people saw him heal the blinded eye. They saw him uh, make the lame to walk. They cast out demons. I mean, all the miracles, they couldn't even write them all. He said the world couldn't attain it. But they were astonished at his doctrine because it says he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Do you know why his word got their attention? Because the word is authoritative. You say, well, what good does it do to tell a lost world what this book says when they don't believe it? Its authority is not affected by whether or not you believe it. You know, you've seen the little bumper sticker. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And I understand where they're coming from, but that's really not the case. God said it. That settles it. Doesn't make any difference if you believe it or not. And, you know, even a person can say intellectually, I don't believe that. I reject it. The authority of God's word is bigger than your rejection. Why are you so upset about it? I mean, here's some uh, maybe spouse. Let's say there's a man. He knows the Lord Jesus. He's saved, and he goes to church, and he's trying to serve God. Maybe his wife is not saved. Maybe she's an intellectual. She's a, a Ph.D. at the university, and she's perfectly fine. If the husband wants to go do that, no problem. But I'm just too intelligent. I'm too smart. I don't believe that. You know, if he really or she really didn't believe it, and really was just that intelligent, didn't care, she'd probably show up a few times just out of appeasement to the wife. If she was a member of the Kiwanis Club, or if she went to a a, a place uh, that maybe he just didn't enjoy that much, he'd do it just to appease her. But because it's the Bible, because it's God, because it's religion, I won't have anything to do with it. That in itself proves the authority of the Bible. Why Its enemies show us exactly its power. Why is it so protested? Why are we against it? Why wouldn't we look at it at least as an influential book? I mean, you go into school and they'll study every type of influential literature there is. But boy, just let somebody bring up a Bible. Let them just try to mention the teachings of so-called the Apostle Paul or bring up Moses or let the Ten Commandments be quoted. Man, get that book out of here. It's authoritative. There's something about those words. You know, first of all, the words are uh, words of integrity. You know, Jesus said not one jot nor tittle, Matthew five eighteen, will pass away except the whole law be fulfilled. That's getting down pretty precise. Jesus, you're really going out on a limb now, every jot or tittle. I mean, that's the smallest part of the Hebrew alphabet. I mean, surely there's going to be some, some errors in it somewhere. I mean, with all these words and all these different men writing, there's got to be some contradictions. There's got to be some plurals that ought to be singular or something. No, Jesus said jot and tittle. It'll never change. It'll always be the same. And it always has been. Well, this Bible also has integrity, you recognize, because uh, it is inspired by God himself. God said, I gave this book. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave them the words, and God's willing to stand behind them. You know, this word is also, it has authority, and I don't have to defend it. I contend for it 
but I don't have to defend it. It defends itself. Someone looks at it and says, well, I just don't believe the Bible. So you really can't affect me. Well, Isaiah 50, uh, 55, 11 says his word shall not return unto him void. I mean, just like there's an ecosystem where the water uh, comes down and eventually makes its way to the ocean, back up to the clouds, and then down, it's described in Isaiah 55, 11, uses snow and saying the snow melts and comes back, which, by the way, the scientific community didn't know when Isaiah wrote Isaiah 55, but God did. And he said, just like the water will make its way back and it's just systems through and continues to cycle, he says, my word will go and it'll come back to me accomplishing exactly what I wanted to accomplish. It won't be destroyed. It'll water the crops. It'll give something people to drink. You can, you can do what you want to. It will get back to me and it'll go. And God says it's eternal and it never stops. Now that's authority. And then all we have to do is sit back and watch. You know, when the rain falls, we can see the result. When it dries up, we can see the result. Literally. I mean, if there's a drought, it's obvious. If there's a lot of water, everything's blooming. Well, do you know when the word of God is flowing freely, the fruits are evident. When there's a drought of the word of God, it's evident. I mean, look at the changed lives. Every place the Bible has ever gone has improved where it went. You say, well, what's your opinion of improve? Well, you can use the world's definition of improve. It makes productive citizens. It makes drunks become sober. Harlots become pure. Thieves become honest. What do they have that can do that? What kind of authority does the world give us that can make productive citizens out of thieves and harlots and drunkards and so forth? But we've got the Bible who's done it multiple times. Second Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The authority of the word of God. So if I'm going to have a stable life, certainly I need to, first of all, recognize the rock. Recognize these sayings of mine as the foundation. Let me show you secondly. I believe also what Jesus is saying here. This is the second aspect. Is not only do I recognize it, I need to respond to it. Now, I know most of you in here today would say, well, you know, I believe that Bible is the word of God. I believe it's the words of Jesus. I believe it can help. I believe show people how to be saved. I believe it can change me. So he said, whosoever hath these sayings of mine, we have them, and doeth them. Are we going to respond to the foundation? Now, that's the key, to hear the sayings and to do them. Now, what does it mean to do them? Well, obviously, the obedience, but implied in the obedience is the exposure to the word of God. Now you may have heard this story before, but there was a pastor who went out to visit one of his parishioners. And I can honestly say it wasn't me in case you're trying to read into it. Okay. This pastor went out to visit one of his parishioners and he spoke with this lady. She had a number of number of children and they were all playing in the bedroom and around and so forth. And she had a couple of little small ones. Husband was off at work and he was talking to her about things and they got to talking about the Bible. And he began to bring up some kind of passage. Well, he didn't have his, his Bible with him, and he just went to visit her as a church member, and, and he said, you know, uh, do you have your Bible handy? She said, well, certainly. She called over her little girl, who was maybe, you know, three, four years old, and said, uh, baby, would you go in the, uh, the bedroom there and get that book that you see me reading every morning? Of course, she had to put a little plug in there for the preacher, you know, to let her know she read her Bible every morning. But you go in there and get that book that you see me reading every morning. So in a few minutes later, the girl shows up and got a romance novel. Now, you understand, we've got the Bible. We own the Bible. We have the Bible. But do you read the Bible? You say, well, I read it all the time. Every time Sunday you tell me to turn over to the text, I'm right there with you. I mean, I've got it, and that's great. I wouldn't have you leave it at home. And, and that's wonderful, but do you really read the Word of God? Are you exposed to it? Do you know the Bible says in Psalm 119, uh, verse 169, I believe it is, it says, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. You know, I uh, am very unlucky when it comes to these little uh, Things they do at the stores when they give out prizes and stuff, or when you like you take the little thing off the McDonald's cup and try to win something or whatever. I mean, I, I hardly ever win anything. But you know, I've definitely never won any money, like a hundred dollars or something like that. Where I'm just, I've known people that did, 
I've never known anyone that won a million or anything, but I've known people to win little the cash prizes from these sweepstakes. Um, they used to do one at the grocery store where you played bingo and you tried to put the thing on there. And every once in a while, somebody I knew wins. And then they have instant prizes. But you know, I hardly ever win one of those things. But every once in a while, I remember we played the bingo thing. I'd get the little instant $2. I mean, I won $2 just from popping this little thing out. I have won a free large fry at McDonald's before. That really got me. I mean, man, a large fry, I got one. You just think, look, I'm, I'm telling you, I don't win much. And when I win one of those things, I think, man, isn't that something? I'm, my luck's changing here. But, you know, what would it be like if you were to open up one of those things and you had won $5,000 or something like that, just bought some groceries and they give you a thing, or McDonald's, you know, you get the right, I don't know what the park place or whatever it is you're trying to get on the McDonald's monopoly. I mean, imagine opening it up and finding that. Boy, you'd rejoice over that, wouldn't you? But God says, the psalmist says, I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Now, listen, I don't blame you one bit. I know I'm in your case. I know right where you are, this old flesh, there's plenty of times where the last thing you want to do is open up and read, especially literature that's thick and heavy, and you've got to really concentrate. I, I'm not really a big reader. I was talking to someone recently. I've never read a, no, a whole novel, I don't believe. My wife could hardly believe I went through high school, and I started several of them for literature class, never finished the first one. I just, I just didn't like them. And, you know, I'd write a book report off of it or whatever, and I didn't even know how it ended. I just heard from somebody. I, I just don't like reading novels. I'm not into that, but people are. Some people love to read novels, and some books are kind of like chewing gum in the sense that you're just reading them, and that's fine. That's entertainment. No problem that the book's not bad material. The Bible is not a book like that. I understand. It's a little heavier. It's a little deeper. You've got to put your mind in gear and your heart in gear. Certainly, there have been many times, I can tell you, that I've thought to myself, I need to read the Bible today, and the flesh says, I don't want to read the Bible today. But I don't know too many times I've ever opened it up and read it, and when I got done, I man, what a waste of time that was. Now, most of the time when I get done, even if my mind wasn't completely in gear, God still ministered to me through his word. You see, I wonder if this word is to you like the rejoicing of your heart, like David said. I wonder if you're like Job when he said, I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Hey, there's been a plenty of time that I have tried to go to bed or the thought has come to me. Oh, man, I, boy, I really ought to read the Bible today or I need to spend some more time reading the Bible today. And the thought, a thousand excuses have come up why I ought not do it. And then the thought will come to me sometimes. Job said it was more important to him than his food. So I don't have time to read the Bible. You don't understand my schedule. You're a preacher. You only work on Sunday and Wednesday. You don't have a whole lot else to do. I mean, you don't understand my schedule, what I'm like. Man, I do this. I've got this to go to. I'm constantly on the move and all this. I just don't have time. My question is, you have time to eat? You found time to do that, didn't you? You say, well, just how much time am I supposed to do it? I mean, what do you think? You ought to just start by just doing it. Whatever amount of time. Might be five minutes. It might just start. Found time to eat. Find time to eat. Be exposed to the Word of God. Jesus said, don't just have the saying. Do it. Expose yourself to it. I'll tell you how else you get exposed to the Bible. God has given to the church pastors, teachers, evangelists. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 5.20, despise not prophesying. Through preaching, you get exposed to the Word of God. You know, some people get a, a, a steady diet of the Word of God. They come to church once a month, whether they need it or not. I mean, they just want to be exposed to it. You understand that coming to the church can be the same way. You say, have you ever woke up in the morning and didn't want to come to church? I can honestly say not one time have I ever got up and didn't want to go to church. There's been many times I've got up and didn't want to go to church. It wasn't just once. You understand, our flesh a lot of times may not want to go, may not want to hear, but we need to be exposed to preaching. And it really isn't up to me to decide how often I ought to get it. I ought to just follow God and not be, uh, not forsake the assembling myself together and listen to the word of God when God gives me an opportunity to hear it. We ought to be exposed to it. I mean, how is it, how important is it to you to listen to preaching? You say, well, it's just incidental. If I get a chance, that's great. Well, then you don't believe what God said about preaching. It's God ministers to us through preaching. I mean, it's an important part of our Christian life. That's why God set it up that way. 
And so we ought to seek it. So we got to be exposed to the Word of God. And then we're almost out of time, but we've got to experience the Word of God. Look, if you would, at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is one of the oldest passages, if not the oldest book in the New Testament. And he begins this first chapter talking about trials and difficulties that we go through. And he says almost exactly what Jesus said in chapter 1 and verse 22. He says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any be a hearer of the word... And not a doer, implied is that you're being deceived. He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. It's like a man looking in the mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So a person who has the word of God and looks at it will be like somebody who looked in the mirror. And the purpose you looked in there is to see what needs to be corrected. Now, some of you just looked and gave up. <laughs> There's no need and walked off, right? But if you looked in the mirror to see what needed correcting, and you said, well, it's obvious here. My hair needs to be combed. Um, I probably ought to wash my face, and, and depending on who you are, I ought to put some makeup on. Um, and you don't. What was the purpose? Why'd you even look? You should have just said, I'll feel a whole lot better if I just ignore it. If I just walk out, at least I'll have blissful ignorance about how I look. But when you look, you ought to try to do something about it. Now, that's an obvious illustration. But Jesus is saying here, be doers of the word, not hearers only, because if you're a hearer and not a doer, you'd be just like somebody who looked and said, so what? I just read it, but so what? You ought to experience it. He applies it like this in verse 25. But whoso looketh into, as if it were a mirror, the perfect law of liberty, the Bible, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, I want, rather than quote it to you, I want you to turn quickly to first, or 2 Corinthians 3, because I'd like you to see this as well. We're not going to move much further along, so I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And notice what happens here. You tie this together, Matthew 7. Whoso heareth these sayings of mine, doeth them. You go to first, uh, James chapter 1, verse 22, be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Because when you're a continual hearer, then you're blessed in your deed. And then notice the idea, this imagery of the mirror, no pun intended, in verse 18. It says, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass. Now that's the mirror. And this time it's talking about the Lord himself. Behold, we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Now, let me ask you this. What are you going to be able to look into and see the glory of the Lord? You can't look into yourself. This isn't just sitting by a pond and meditating. This isn't just trying to clear your mind of all of the thoughts and just get quiet before. No, there's got to be something I'm looking into. Now, granted, I can look in the Bible, memorize truth. I might be at work, and I might m meditate on the things that I've read in the Bible. It's far beyond just the time that I scan the words. But the way I look at God's glory is by reading His revelation or remembering His revelation. It's more to it than just the time I read it. But I behold it as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, and what will happen? I'll be changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, we talked about the mirror. You look into the physical mirror, and you look in there, and you're kind of like Joey. You know, he used to look back in that mirror when he was 25. Everything was good. He got up to be about 30, and he had a little bit less hair right here. Then he got up a little bit older than that. Before he knew it, it was getting a little bit farther back. Try as he might. Now, fortunately, he didn't go with the comb over. We appreciate that, all right? <laughs> he didn't try to, you know, make it meet in the middle and so forth. Um, that comb over is an attempt to change it yourself, Right? I just, I'm going to hide it. Nobody will notice. It's, nobody can see this thing till the wind blows, right? <laughs> There's that number. Now, you can't do much about it. You look in it and you think, hey, I'm, I'm reminded, no problem. I just, hey, it is what it is. I'm done. That's all I can do. Some of us look at things that are correctable. We say, well, um, I could hide this. I could fill in this ditch with this stuff and all of this. I mean, you know, we make attempts. But do you get what he's saying here? 
is when I look into the perfect law of liberty, God makes the changes. I look in and I see the problem. When I compare myself to the glory of God and I realize, boy, there's some things I'm saying I ought not say. There's some things that I'm thinking I ought not think. There's some activities I'm involved in I ought not be involved in. My heart is not where it needs to be and I'm reminded of it. And I go to God and I'm looking in the mirror and it says God changes us from glory to glory. He doesn't just change you by default. He changes you because you've heard the saying and doing it is simply an act of willingness to let God do it through you. God will change you and you'll be more like Jesus every day because you know his word. You're exposed to it and you experience it. Now I've got to be exposed to it. I've got to meditate in. I mean, no wonder we find in Joshua 1, 8, that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, that thou shalt meditate therein day and night. You know, again, I'm not concerned about how much you, some of you may be able to pour over the Bible for an hour and read it because you love to read and you love to study, and that's helpful, that's good. I wouldn't diminish that. Others of you say, man, I don't read anything for, a, for an hour. It's tough for me to read the instructions on the back of the bottle and so forth. I mean, hey, well, read just about that much of the Scripture and read it several times and get a hold of it Hey, I'll guarantee you two verses that you spend five minutes on reading and getting a hold of would be better than not getting a hold of the Word of God at all. And who knows, you might get a hold of those two verses in such a way and meditate on it all day long. It might stick with you better than somebody who spent a long time in the Bible. God didn't ever stipulate how much, how long. He just said meditate therein day and night. And implied in that means I got to put some of it in me so I can meditate on it. How important is this book to you? To listen to God through his word. To be exposed to the preaching of God's word. To hear these sayings and do them. The last thing I'll just mention in passing is after we recognize it. And after we respond to it. We need to rest in it. I won't turn you back over there. But Matthew 7. It says when the rains come. And the floods descended. It said this man's house stood. You know when I think of rain. I think of trials. I think of difficulties. Every, every life, whether it be just or unjust, rain comes. But when the rain comes, if my foundation is firm, it'll stand. No, Job was able to make it through trials, and he's the one that said, I esteem thy words better than my necessary food. It said, when the wind fell and the floods came. You know, when I think of floods, I think of judgment. Often in the Bible, flood alludes to judgment. And let me tell you, a way to escape the judgment is to trust what this Bible says about Jesus and have your sin dealt with. There is an eternal judgment. There's an eternal hell. It's prepared for the devil and his angels, but some folks, unfortunately, will go there because they reject what Jesus did to provide for them to stay out. And then the winds. When the winds came. Do you know wind is a picture of false doctrine? The winds of doctrine blow, and the only way you're going to defeat the winds of false doctrine is a firm foundation in what God had to say. You know, I was just recently talking to somebody about this story, and it, it stuck in my mind. I've heard something like this a couple of different times. I think it's happened more than once, but this personal experience someone gave me is a man was in the military, not even sure what conflict it was, and they had issued him a Bible, a New Testament. He had it in his pocket. And literally, when the man was shot at, a bullet hit the Bible, and it saved his life. Whether it injured him a little, it probably did, but it saved his life. The bullet was stopped by the physical New Testament. Of course, after that, he was a lost man. After it was over with, he, that, that so moved him that he wanted to find out about this Bible. And of course, that was just a physical thing. But he, he was saved as a result. And it saved his physical life and saved his spiritual life. Well, you know, I'm not saying today that if you take a Bible on your person that somehow it'll uh, keep you physically safe. That's not the idea. God can do that whether you have it on your person or not. But I am saying that all the devil can hurl at the Bible, just like the enemy could shoot a bullet and that, the pages had ability to stop it, I don't have to have it in my pocket, but if I got it in my heart, it can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Hey, I hope you have a love for it as God would have us love it. Let's have a word of prayer today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and we're going to have prayer. While heads are bowed, eyes are closed, <clears throat> while no one's looking, you know, perhaps you're here today and you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. You don't know that you're saved. Jesus died for your sin. He rose again. He's anxious to save you if you would turn to him. But 
you'd say, I'm concerned about my soul. Don't embarrass me. Don't point me out, but I would let you pray for me. Now, I will remember a raised hand in the prayer. I wouldn't embarrass you, come to you in any way, but I would just remember a raised hand. But if you'd say, I'm concerned about my soul, I want you to pray for me, would you slip a hand up today that I might pray for you? Anyone like that at all? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. You know, perhaps there are believers today. You know Christ, you're on your way to heaven, and you do believe the Bible, believe it's authoritative, and you probably read the Bible and probably want it in your heart. But maybe God has spoke to your heart today in a way that there's a need there, and you'd say, I need God's grace in this area. I want you to remember me in the prayer. As a believer, can I pray for you? My heads are bowed. Yes, thank you. I see those. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You may take those down. Thank you. God, we're thankful today for your word. And I didn't see a hand to indicate there was anyone here who is struggling today with salvation, but that's just a hand. I can't see people's hearts. There could be somebody today who is lost that needs Christ, and I pray that you'd work in that heart, make it clear. Lord, there are believers today that slipped up a hand. A number of hands went up. I don't know what it is you've dealt with them about, but I'm thankful that their heart is sensitive, that they're open to say, I need prayer, I need your grace. I pray that you'd give them grace specifically in that, that they'd see their lives move ahead spiritually. And that you get glory through it. Lead today in this invitation time. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. <clears throat> our instruments begin to play and I invite you. If you don't know Christ, you come and I'll have someone take you aside with a Bible, take you over to another room, show you how to be saved. You make that move this morning. Meet me here at the front while heads are bowed. As a Christian, perhaps this morning as you're here, you need to respond and say, God, I need grace in this thing you've dealt with me about. I want to see growth in my life and I want you to help me. I'd invite you to come and find a place of prayer this morning. Ask God for his help as we have this invitation time. Amen. Amen. You can look this way. I appreciate very much your being in the service this morning. We are going to meet again tonight at six o'clock and we would certainly encourage you to be with us. Let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer. And I'm going to ask Joey if he would pray for us.